In this video, we're going to take a look at a trigonometric integral for a Calculus 2 class. One that's a little tricky for some people, requires several steps, and I'm going to show all the steps today. I'm going to show how to get it as a definite integral, but then also show you what the answer would be if you're looking at it as an indefinite integral that is an antiderivative. That's today on High Peak Education. Thank you everyone for your attention. And let's just go ahead and get into our problem because you'll see how this is set up, how we can set up this integral, and let's get going. So here we have a calculus 2 integral for, with some trigonometric functions for which we have to evaluate this integral using methods of reducing it to integrals that we can integrate. So let's take a closer look at the problem. It's namely secant x minus cosine x parentheses squared dx. Now I tried integrating this before but it turns out that it was too difficult to do if you tried to make secant x equal to 1 over cosine x, find a common denominator and then 1 minus cosine x and then when you went from there after the common denominator, 1 minus cosine squared x in the numerator becomes sine squared x, applied the squared, you'd end up with sine to the fourth x over cosine squared x, which would be tan squared x times sine squared x. And that's a little difficult to integrate because otherwise you need to use the power reducing formulas for both tangent squared and sine squared x. If you don't know exactly what I mentioned, don't worry about it. But in any case, let's consider a different method here. Because trigonometry is about relationships, sometimes you need to kind of play around with it a little bit in terms of changing what the integrand looks like before you actually try integrating it with trigonometric functions. So if you have this, we note that this is exactly a binomial subtraction squared. But let's not forget that whenever we need to, we can replace secant x with 1 over cosine x because again they are reciprocal functions of each other. So how do we expand a binomial squared? So secant x is the reciprocal function of cosine x but here we're going to expand out the binomial in parentheses with the binomial squared formula to integrate separate terms and get cancellation with the reciprocals in the middle term. So recall from your algebra classes that if you have a binomial squared so that's a minus b squared that ends up calculating out to using FOIL. Remember FOIL is first, outer, inner, last. a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. And the minus 2ab comes from the fact that the outer term and the inner term are both the same, so they double up with a factor of 2 here. And in this case, we're going to let a just equal secant x and b equal cosine x. So indeed, this is exactly what we get. We FOIL out, that is we square out these terms. We end up with secant squared x minus 2 secant x cosine x plus cosine squared x. But now we can leverage the fact that secant x is indeed the reciprocal of cosine x. Secant x times cosine x here, secant x becomes 1 over cosine x. And 1 over cosine x times cosine x, those are reciprocals of each other. Those should cancel. So this term becomes 2. So now we have these three terms, secant squared x minus 2 plus cosine squared x. Notice it's in double red underline because not only is it the binomial squared, but it's exactly what we can replace the integrand. That is the quantity under the integral with these terms. In fact, let's do that with these three terms that are underlined in the double red underline on the previous page and break up the integral into three separate smaller integrals over the addition and subtraction signs. So we get this. We get the integral from 0 to pi over 4 of secant squared x dx minus the integral from 0 to pi over 4 of 2 dx plus the integral from 0 to pi over 4 of cosine squared x dx. Now, these first two integrals are actually relatively straightforward. The first integral is a common integral from the integration tables. I believe that secant squared is the derivative of the tangent function. 
So when we take the antiderivative, we should end up with tangent x. This second integral is like 2 as a constant, and you just integrate it. So that's really like 2 times x to the 0 power. So if you use the power rule for integrals, you go 1 power higher, x to the power 1. Reciprocal of that power in front, you just get 2x. Another way of saying that is the derivative of a line which has slope 2 is 2, and so the antiderivative would just be 2, especially x, 2x for the antiderivative as long as we are doing it as a definite integral. And then finally, with this cosine squared x, how can we deal with this integral? So hopefully many of you have seen this before. This is what we sometimes call the power reducing formula for cosine. So whenever you have, let's say, a sine squared integral or a cosine squared integral, because there's no other trig function in there that works in a u substitution, we do have to reduce the power by the power reducing formula, sometimes called the double angle formula with a squared in it, and it's a trigonometric identity. So indeed, on the next line, this is what we have for these three integrals. Integrate secant squared x, we get tangent x, and the bounds are 0 to pi over 4. Integrate 2 dx, that's just 2x, 0 to pi over 4, don't forget there's a minus there. Plus, and here's the power reducing formula, you see it's in this pink highlight. It's 1 plus cosine 2x over 2 dx. Now there's a couple of ways to do this last integral, but I think the easiest way is to probably just break it up into two separate integrals. Again, you could break this up over addition because integrals can be broken up over addition or subtraction. So we start using the fundamental theorem of calculus for tangent x and for minus 2x. We put in pi over 4 for the upper bound. We put in 0 for the lower bound. And we subtract them. Then we move the 1 half out front for both of these separate integrals on the last set of integrals. And it's 1 half integral from 0 to pi over 4 dx plus 1 half integral 0 to pi over 4 cosine 2x dx. So this third term is actually pretty straightforward because that just integrates to x. It's like the integral of the number 1 with a 1 half out front between 0 and pi over 4. How about this last integral? So let's evaluate each of these four terms in the front to simplify them. So separately in blue, green, purple, we'll evaluate those. This orange term, again, is just going to integrate to x. We're going to put in the bounds. It's straightforward. This final remaining integral can be accomplished via u substitution. Now, there are other ways to do it. That's probably the most straightforward way. I know how. So on the final integral, let's let u equal 2x. So du is 2dx. We took the differential of both sides. But if we solve for dx here, which we must replace for, we have 1 half du equals dx because we're seeking a proper differential. So what that means is we want the differential here being exactly the derivative of what's inside here because u is exactly 2x. We also should change the bounds of integration. So these are x bounds from 0 to pi over 4. So when I take x equaling 0 and I plug it into the u formula, then u lower bound is 0. But if I take pi over 4, which is the upper x bound, and I plug that into the u formula, I have 2 pi over 4, which simplifies to pi divided by 2. So that's now the new upper bound. So let's go ahead and start simplifying these terms. Tangent of pi over 4 is exactly 1. Pi over 4 is in radians. The tangent of 0 radians is 0. Whenever you subtract 0 inside of parentheses, it makes no difference because it's nothing. So we end up with minus 2 times pi over 4. This integrates to x, 0 to pi over 4. And because we had to replace this dx with 1 half du, 1 half times this 1 half ends up being 1 fourth. And u is 2x. And then now we have du in here because, again, dx became 1 half du. And the new bounds are 0 to pi over 2. Now, if we simplify these front terms, this is 1. And this is going to be minus, and I think it's going to be pi over 2. So 1 minus pi over 2. Then we plug in the bounds here. It's pi over 4 minus 0. So 1 half times pi over 4, that's going to give us pi over 8 in a moment. 
the integration of cosine u du is just sine u. And then the bounds are 0 to pi over 2. All right, let's finish this up on the next slide, and we'll be done. So evaluate this with a common denominator for this final integral, especially with these front terms. So we end up with 1 minus pi over 2 can become 4 pi over 8 because 1 half times pi over 4 is pi over 8. So that way we can combine these in just a moment. Let's keep the 1 fourth out front here. The sine of pi over 2 minus the sine of 0 from the fundamental theorem of calculus. So 4 pi over 8 minus pi over 8 is 3 pi over 8. We still have the 1 out front. Then it's plus 1 fourth times sine of pi over 2 is 1. Sine of 0 is 0. Pi over 2 is in radians. 1 fourth times 1 is just 1 fourth. And then 1 plus 1 fourth, because this is 1 fourth times 1, is just 5 fourths. So this is 5 fourths minus 3 pi over 8. And then one last time, common denominator, multiply this first fraction by 2 over 2. That's 10 over 8. 10 minus 3 pi over 8. And that's going to be our exact answer. So this is the exact answer for this integral. So this is indeed how we integrate secant x minus cosine x squared and how we do it as a definite integral. Now, by the way, if you want the full antiderivative, the full antiderivative is going to be 1 fourth sine of 2x minus 3 halves x plus tangent x plus c. So a couple things. First of all, it's an antiderivative because it's an indefinite integral if there was no bounds. That's why it has a plus c because there's an unknown constant of integration. Notice what we would have had is we would have had negative 2x plus a 1 half from integrating the sine, from integrating the term here, that's this term right here, you would have gotten a plus one half x. Then that negative two x plus a half x would have been negative three halves x. Remember the integration of cosine is sine, but the u was two x. But remember, just like we saw here, we do end up with a one fourth out front. And then remember the tangent x was just the integration of the secant squared x. So indeed, if you were coming to this video to see the antiderivative, not like the definite integral, you could verify your answer as such and follow along with the work that it's already been mentioned. So what we saw in this problem is that we had to manipulate it in a way that made sense. We had to get the integral into several smaller integrals, some of which were easier to do, some of which were a little more challenging. But notice the first couple of times I took a whack at this problem, I wasn't able to get it because I was trying to do common denominator. And so it's not always obvious and easy because trig anometry is about relationships. And we want to make sure that we figure out how those things go together. So hope that makes sense. Hope that's helpful. So let us know down in the comments how you're going to use this in your life, in your work, in your business, in your courses. And thank you for watching High Peak Education. Please smash that like button as you enjoy this content. Please subscribe to the channel to grow the channel. Social media links are down in the description as well. We look forward to seeing you also in the next video.